and we're good. All right. Don't know if anybody's joined us in the chat yet, but welcome to the inaugural Around the 412 Fantasy Football Show. This is the first one. There's going to be plenty of them. They're going to get better. Um, so if you're looking at it now, if stuff happens along the way, it's going to happen. Uh, this is a prototype. There's no blueprint for what we're doing here. So bear with us. Um, I'm pretty confident that with the desire that Donnie and I have here, that we will pull everything together and make it work and just get better and better each week. With that said, I am your host, Smitty, and with me every week will be my co-host, Donnie Druin. Donnie, thank you uh, so much for having me. It's super early here on the West Coast, uh, but <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, every, every Sunday will be like this, so I'm ready to ready to get after it. Mm-hmm. Very passionate about this. Um, we both are, which is why you know this works so well, why we both wanted to do it. Um, we had been talking about it for a while. Finally, uh, in June, we announced it and pulled the trigger on doing it. And um, like I said, super excited to be doing it. Um, plan to have it be a weekly thing. Uh, variety of fantasy football topics, whatever you guys want to hear us talk about, whatever you want to see us talk about if you are going to join us on twitch that's awesome um but you know you type in the chat and let us know tweet at us let us know what you want to hear us talk about other than that we're going to do our best to come up with a variety of topics to talk about not just your standard you know rankings because anybody can do that right so um this week you know donnie and i have been throwing back and forth some topics so uh we are going to discuss that obviously uh we got a nice little list for everybody uh, with this being the first one, like I said, I mean, I hope that it uh, it piques everybody's interest, uh, what we're going to talk about. Uh, people are getting close to that draft time. Neither Don or I have had a draft yet. Thank God, you know, the first preseason games were just played, so that's, that's a good thing. You know, you don't have those injuries that you typically have to deal with. I've finally been able to move my draft drafts back due to everybody graduating college and stuff now. So... Uh, I'm super excited about that. But anyway, it is very close to draft season for most people. So this is a good time to start doing this. And um, I think we can kind of kind of jump right into it. So, Donnie, why don't you uh, introduce the first topic for us? Definitely, yeah. So uh, Duke Johnson was finally traded from the Cleveland Browns to the Houston Texans for what was called a conditional draft pick. So it's originally going to be a fourth-round pick. But I believe if he plays 10 games in 2019, that will turn into a third uh, very interesting trade. Early in the offseason, uh, there were rumblings about Duke Johnson not wanting to be uh, in Cleveland anymore, especially after the Kareem Hunt signing. Uh, it's kind of understandable for him. He was never really like the featured back for the Browns. Uh, Nick Chubb took over that role in 2018, and he ran with it. Uh, so Duke Johnson traded to the Texans. Now, there's a couple of different ways we can look at this trade. Uh, so I want to pull up his target numbers the last uh, four seasons, because obviously Duke Johnson, if you don't, don't know, uh, big pass catcher, doesn't run the ball a ton. I think he had maybe 200 rushing yards last season, if that. Uh, so his target numbers, uh, his four seasons he's played in the NFL are going to be 74, 72, 93, and 62. Uh, the collective running back targets the Texans had last year, 68. Um, so obviously this is going to be a huge upgrade for the Texans and what they can do. Uh, they do have a first-time offensive coordinator, and uh, what's his name? Tim Kelly. Yep, yep, that's his name. Uh, Tim Kelly, uh, first season offensive coordinator for the Houston Texans. So the the time of the trade is kind of weird for me, just because I I think they already had like their playbook installed. Um, whenever they traded for Duke Johnson, granted you can make tweaks and you know uh, minor adjustments to it, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it, it's definitely an interesting trade. Uh, Smitty, what do you think this does for like the value of a guy like Lamar Miller, who uh, you know, he doesn't necessarily make his, like, mark in the passing game, but you got to think this, like, diminishes his value at least a little bit. Right. Uh, well, first things first, Tyler, Beefy's in here. He just came in and said, you're. So, what's good? Um, as to your question, I kind of want to take that and expand on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. For Lamar Miller, I think he's the only guy in this picture that it decreases the value. I think Dude Johnson's value goes up, and I think both the backs in Cleveland, once Kareem Hunt does come back, his value goes up. Obviously, Nick Chubb's value goes up because for eight weeks, he's the only guy there now. Um, yeah. So he was already being drafted as an RB1, really. Um, but, yeah, this definitely just really skyrockets his value. Uh, specifically for Duke Johnson, though, you look at Houston, you look at um, the injury that they've already had to a guy that would have been probably the number two or three receiver in uh, Kiki Kuti. 
Um, but uh, I, I think that there's a ton of targets to go around there behind DeAndre Hopkins. And for Duke Johnson, he's definitely now in consideration to be well, definitely a flex. It'll be interesting to see people how running back hungry people are if he can be an RB2 in a PPR league. Um, but like I said, behind DeAndre Hopkins, there's a ton of balls to go around there. Um, Lamar Miller, like you said, can he be involved in the passing game? I mean, maybe a little bit, but I don't think he's going to be now with Duke Johnson. I mean, you acquired him for a reason. You're giving up probably a third-round pick because I expect him to play 10 games to to get him. So um, I, I think that Duke Johnson, his value is definitely there. Right, and this is kind of a weird situation because, uh, like I kind of alluded to earlier, we've never really seen like a prominent pass-catching running back with Houston um, and so it, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of like work him in. Um, but like kind of flipping to like the Brown side of things, um, I, I think you kind of touched on it. Nick Chubb for eight weeks, all him. It's all Nick Chubb in that backfield. Um, that being said, though, because the Browns have so little depth, do you like foresee them at all trying to like limit his touches just to like preserve him over the course of the season? Um, that's interesting because up until when Kareem Hunt co- does come back, who's the, who's, who they have back there still behind Chubb? Yeah. So, I mean, um, Hunt, Hunt doesn't return until week eight cause he's suspended. Um, and the Brown second string running back as of now, after Duke Johnson trade is going to be Dontrell Hilliard, which uh, people liked him. He did really well in the first preseason game, apparently. Um, well, I don't know, like. It, the door's wide open for Nick Chubb to hit crazy RB1 numbers, especially in an offense where it's going to be opened up by guys like Baker, Odell, um, Jarvis Landry, David Njoku, guys like that. Um, but I don't know. Just so the, a little tiny part of me is scared that they don't want to run him into the ground. They might be a little bit shy to work him like 30 touches a game like he should. Yeah, and I mean, with all the... With all the once again, with all the weapons they have there, I know they don't have Antonio Callaway for four games now. Um, yeah, they, can, they definitely can do most of their damage through the air, and maybe you know only run the ball fifteen times a game or something like that. But I but, think that Nick Chubb I mean, definitely he, is a workhorse back. But like you said, with with not having the depth behind him until week ten because they have their bye week after f- immediately following the eight game suspension, so Kareem Hunt won't actually be back till week ten. Um, it will be interesting to see how they have to manage Chubb's touches. Right. Do you do you think Hunt realistically like steals a lot of that spotlight? Because I I have Chubb being the great running back he is, and him kind of expected to continue the great 2018 season he had. Let's say he carries carries that over. Sorry, through the first eight games of the season, or you know, however many Hunt ends up being suspended for. Uh, I don't I don't foresee Cream Hunt coming in and taking a whole bunch of that like prominent touches away from him. I mean, yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with you. I think it's going to go based a lot of what Chubb does. I mean, that's the easy answer is, you know, Chubb's first eight weeks should really dictate that. Or he Either he's going to take that job and really hammer it down and say, nobody's stealing touches from me. But what if he also doesn't play that well in those first eight games? I mean, either way, I think he's either closing the door or opening the door. So I think yeah, that that's you know, the, the Hunt suspension is going to, you know, force that one way or another to happen. He's either going to open the door for Hunt to take touches away from him, or he's going to completely slam the door in the idea of anybody doing so. Yeah, and that's kind of like shitty timing for fantasy players as well, because like week eight, week nine, that's when you're really starting to like make that push for the fantasy playoffs, because there's only about like four or five weeks left in the regular season. So uh, it's kind of the make or break time. And obviously we won't have like a clear picture until that time comes, but uh, Nick Chubb, his his ADP's average draft position is currently you know, sitting at number eighteen, so it's about like second to third round depending on what league you play on. So I I totally feel comfortable taking him at that spot. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure why our uh, interactive chat here isn't working, but I do have it pulled up uh, in front of me. So I'm, I'm going to read off some of the comments that just came in. Uh, Beefy's here. Uh, good one from the Trash Cats was here, and Herb just joined as well. Uh, Beefy said he could probably be more of an RB2 in bigger leagues, say a 12-14 to 14 team lead, but 8-10, to 10, like the one that we are in, don't see him as an RB2, more of a flex since it's less watered down. Um, I can get on board with that 100%. Um, good one, who's a Jaguars fan, said he's, the Jags should have traded for the Duke. Um, Beefy said, wouldn't they want to ease Hunt back into game speed as well while everyone else is in mid-season form? Yeah, also also very true. I mean, 
like you, it's kind of hard to just jump back in there all of a sudden in week 10 and start playing football. So, I mean, how much would yeah, you even take yeah. away right at the beginning? So that, and then uh, uh, Herb said they do need someone behind Fournette and Jacksonville, to be honest. Well, it's not Duke Johnson because Duke Johnson's in Houston, but <laughs> um, no, uh, just the fantasy outlook on this. Um, like I said when we first started talking about it, I think that it increases the value for three out of the four guys involved. Um, you know, if if anything, if anything for Kareem Hunt, he's probably more just like the same. Um, I, I think it, it's an uptick for Chubb and it's an uptick for Duke Johnson, and I think it's a a downtick for Lamar Miller, who now really I don't foresee having a role in the passing game in Houston. Yeah, I, I think this is like a win-win for everybody in this scenario, except for Lamar Miller. Uh, but granted, he kind of like capped himself by only being involved in like a rushing attack in Houston. So um, we'll see. You know, it's kind of a wait and see situation to see what the usage will be like. But the, the Texans aren't going to give up a potentially like fourth, third round pick and not use him. So right. Yeah, so I'm saying well, it's a fourth round pick, but it turns into a third if he plays ten games. He, I mean, yeah. I don't see him not being involved in ten games. Like, why is he gonna? He's gonna be scratched for six games. So, um, yeah. What was the What was the next topic? Uh, so, fantasy overreactions for week one. Mm. Uh, I, I know we've been kind of itching, uh, oh, people. you know, to get some overreactions to this. Uh, football is here. Live football is here. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's nice not to uh, load up NFL Game Pass and watch games I've seen for ten times over. All right, so uh, Smitty, give me give me one overreaction you got. I mean, you know, let's let's stick it. Oh, I, I probably should have introduced this at the beginning of the show. If anybody's in here that's not, you know, from Pittsburgh, we're both Steeler fans. So yeah, just sticking Huge. with that theme, um, I'll, I'm going to say that James Washington. Oh, you bet. Ends up you ends up being ends up being a wide receiver one, not just a wide receiver two, a wide receiver one this year. Interesting. See, I I have him as a wide receiver two. That was actually one of my guys as well. Well, that's so that's really why it's an overreaction to say it's a wide receiver one. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So no, man. He he had a really good first half. Four receptions, 84 yards, one touchdown. Uh, granted, that was without Roethlisberger playing, and you know, as we all know, we've seen it for the last nine years. Ben, he'll pick a favorite target and just launch it to him, whatever. <laughs> but no, James Washington looked at every bit of the receiver he was expected to be at Oklahoma State, you know. Right. And I, I think it'll definitely help with a guy like Mason Rudolph throwing him the ball, uh, you know, because they got that, you know, OK State connection going on there. But no, he, he looked really good, man. Like, he, he had that jump ball from Dobbs in the first half of the game, and then he had that really nice back shoulder touchdown. So, you know, he's, it looks like he started putting a lot of the work over the offseason to kind of reform and kind of fine-tune his game. But, dude, he looked nice, man. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that's that's the thing. We, we talked about it on our on our regular show and around the 4-1-2 uh, when you came on. Um, you know, obviously, Juju's the wide receiver one for this team. Um, as far as the wide receiver two, it might be a little bit of an open competition. I, I mean, it's between Moncrief and James Washington, you would think. Um, Deontay Johnson, obviously, they have high hopes for. He was their number one wide receiver on the board when they drafted him. Um, he does. He is dealing with a groin injury right now. But, I mean, I have high hopes for James Washington, too. It's always... I think that we were spoiled as Steeler fans with what Juju did in his rookie year because, you know, you expect the year two leap, and we, and we tend to see that. Um, you know, the, the way that guys, you know, it takes them a season to know what to expect, and then they come into year two ready to rock. Um, yeah. and, and that's what I expect to see with James Washington. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I still, I think for the time being, uh, am more on the Moncrief train. Um, I, I, yeah, mean, I, I went as far as saying I think... Seen... No, go ahead. Good. We, we, we haven't seen Ben and Moncrief on the same field and, right. and until I see Ben actually start giving targets to James Washington, I'm a little hesitant to kind of, um, you know, count him as the wide receiver one in Pittsburgh next to Juju. Right. Well, I said, I went as far as saying that I think Moncrief leads the team in touchdowns. I think that Ju I think that Juju will lead the team, obviously, in receptions and yards. But I think Moncrief has a, has a decent chance to score 10 touchdowns this year. Interesting. So you, you think it'll kind of play out like the whole AB Juju duo did last year, where Juju led basically all of the major statistical categories except for touchdowns. 
Um, yeah, but I also don't see Montreal scoring 15. <laughs> like, I don't see Montreal <laughs> having the year that AB had, hey. but I think that he'll. I think that he'll see. It'll be a hell of a party in Pittsburgh. That man can score 15 Dude, next year. If he if he has the identical stat line to AB did last year, oh man. When's he signing the extension? I was sure. Uh, so my second fantasy overreaction. Kyler Murray is going to finish as a top five quarterback in fantasy football. Uh, we we got one little smidge of him. I don't know if you got to watch that drive at all, but he was in for one drive of the game, Cardinals preseason home opener, and he looked everything is advertised. He, his mobility is on point. The arm strength to get the ball from sideline to sideline, both left and right, uh, phenomenal. Just uh, he looks not. I, I don't want to say he looks super composed, um, just because he hasn't faced like actual actual like regular season like blitz schemes and um, right. you know different things that the coordinators do but man like when when you get somebody that electric with the football like good things are going to happen and it, it helps you got that baseball arm for a cannon as well yeah i i think that i mean i i said it before i thought that was the absolute perfect fit for him in cliff kingsbury's offense um you know, it, it kind of, for the Cardinals to take a quarterback in the first round two years in a row, um, they took some flack for, obviously, and then they s- sell off Rosen one year after, after giving him a first year, or not first year, but a one-year head coach. Actually, he was a first-year head coach. Only letting him go for one year, and obviously Mike McCoy, who had been fired the previous year, and they also fired him. So he's definitely <laughs> an offensive coordinator that is going to have trouble finding another job. So Josh Rosen was put in a terrible spot. Kyler Murray, I feel like, is in a great spot with Cliff Kingsbury. I felt like he was the perfect fit for that team. Um, I, I feel like, you know, relating it to fantasy, which we're going to do on here, I think Christian Kirk could have a huge year. Um, I feel like Larry Fitzgerald probably is what he is at this point. Um, maybe a little bit of an uptick, um, but I don't know. I, and I, as, as far as Tyler Murray, um, I, I saw we were talking about it actually before we started streaming. You know, Juju did his fantasy draft live stream yesterday with the the Fantasy Footballers podcast, and they actually have Kyler Murray as their quarterback. He's the only one that the Fantasy Footballers took. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm big on Kyler Murray. Uh, and so as far as the, your, your overreaction there with a uh, top five fantasy quarterback, listen, the when he gets out of the pocket and might, you know, scramble a little bit, add those rushing yards, it's very possible. Just because look at what Josh Allen ended up doing last year in the last quarter of the yep. season because of that. Right. Um, it, it, now, the thing was, and, and even like, you know, Lamar Jackson, obviously, but Lamar Jackson is on designed runs. Uh, Josh Allen was just scrambling for his life <laughs> and running 30 yards down the field. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little it's different. But anyway, Josh Allen, Josh Allen low-key had a really nice second half to the year last year, fantasy-wise. Yeah, well, see, I, I, I just need to see more consistency from Allen before I can really peg him as, like, one of my, like, go and get fantasy quarterbacks mm-hmm. um oh, the, the arm strength with allen is definitely there and i think that's probably the best asset of his game i just need to hit like see him hit the broad side of a barn a couple times before i can really like trust him going forward uh but you know like cliff kingsbury in arizona uh we saw a little bit of his uh you know offensive uh prominence i guess if you can call it that with his play calling just like the different things we'll see out of him um, so I'm super excited. You know, the Cardinals drafted a lot of great young receivers. Um, I, I think Kevin, Kelvin Harmon is one of them. And then uh, Deshaun, I forgot his name. No, Keyshawn Johnson, yeah. Uh, Keyshawn Johnson looked really nice in the first preseason game as well. And then, like you said, just add on Christian Kirk and Larry Fitzgerald. And, you know, th- those are four guys who can make plays at pretty much any time. So, uh, you know, Christian Kirk is, is – He's got a huge year ahead of him, and a lot of fantasy football people are counting on him to show up. Yeah, um, getting back to our to our chat here that we got going on. Beefy's been on the Kyler Murray hype train. I knew that, you know, from the regular show that we do when we do the college football segment. <laughs> um, he said, "Kyler Murray train, I'm the conductor." <laughs> um, and then he said, "Imagine playing minor league baseball right now," because we all know the Kyler Murray was drafted by the A's. Actually, one pick before the Pirates picked that year and took Travis Swaggerty. Um, he chose to go football uh, in a decision that was very, uh, I'm not going to say, I mean, I'm sure it was a tough decision, but there were a lot of eyes on it because imagine if baseball were able to steal away what ended up being the number one pick. Yep. But obviously that didn't happen. Uh, and he also said Allen's numbers were also helped by D-Rob. Wink, wink. <laughs> so I don't know if you, you know that I went to school with D-Rob, Robert Foster. 
The build. Okay, yeah. So that that's why he said that. Local kid, great guy. Um, actually, funny story. This isn't related to fantasy football. So, but uh, we were at a Pirates game for our live event, the hundredth episode that we did, and I was talking to um, the this this fan from the Mets, and he just came and sat down by us, and um, we're talking, and I asked, you know, where he's from, and he's from Buffalo. Um, but it's six hours to City Field where the Mets play and only three hours to PNC. Um, so every time that the Mets are here, they come here. And we get to talking, and I asked who his other teams were, and, you know, he says the Bills, and I said I'd graduate with a kid that plays on the Bills. He's like, who? And I said Robert Foster. And last year he was in a mall and bought a kid a pair of shoes because his mom didn't want to pay for him. And really? it was his cousin, yeah. And it was his cousin. And he showed me the picture and everything, showed me the Facebook post that had, like, 50,000 shares or something like that. Also, Beefy just said dude was hammered, which he was. Also, we had somebody come in here. I must have... We, we were talking about the receivers. Um, Hakeem Butler is in Arizona. Kelvin Harmon's in Washington. Hakeem Butler. That's what... Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did Hakeem Butler fall to Arizona that far? What was that, in the fifth round? Man, the fifth round? No, they, they, they took him... Yeah, they took him super late, because whenever the Steelers were up to draft Deontay Johnson, I thought for sure that Hakeem Butler was going to be wearing black and gold this year, and they got really excited, so... Yeah. Um, okay, so there's our there's our overreactions. James Washington's going to be a wide receiver one, uh, and Kyler Murray will finish as a top five. Hey, you heard it here first. Fancy quarterback. Yeah, but listen, that's the thing. I feel like people, most people, go into the preseason, and it's like they already have a predetermined idea that they're either just looking to validate or debunk. With, with what I'm saying, do I actually believe James Washington is going to be a wide receiver one? Obviously not, because I said he's not going to be the number two wide receiver in Pittsburgh. Yeah. But that is more so what I feel people are going to think after watching one preseason game. Right, yeah. I think it's important, not just like football fans, but fantasy football players as well. Just take everything with a grain of salt. You know, don't, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't watch somebody play one week and then get your hopes up and then watch them have another, like, kind of... Uh, low snap count for the second week and, you know, start to get your hopes down a little bit. Uh, you know, and coaches, they're just trying to evaluate players through this, you know, four-week process. So. And right, I try as not you to point it out, anything too big. And as you pointed out, Ben didn't touch the field. So, you know, maybe, I don't know if he'll play at all week two, but week three in Tennessee, that's typically where you see the starters play. So I'm not even saying, you know, let's, let's get all these – overreactions and base all our opinions over week three in the preseason. But if you're going to look at the preseason at all and try to form opinions, week three of the preseason is probably when you want to do that. Definitely. Yep. Um, so uh, Tyler also came in here and said, I wanted him in Pittsburgh too. I was convinced we were taking him. Uh, Beefy said, my overreaction, Bush, Bush for defensive rookie of the year. Well, that's happening anyway. That's not an overreaction. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's not even an overreaction. That's an underreaction. That's, that's not my pre. That's not my preseason uh, overreaction. That's my draft day overreaction. I've been saying that since we drafted him. So, Devin Bush, number one in the IDP leagues. Yeah, I'm, I'm mad that we can't. You know, really. Yeah, I was just saying. Other than like leagues that do individual defensive players, which I'm not really about, we can't relate it to it. So we're not going to get to talk about Devin Bush too much on this show. We're gonna have to find ways to bring them up. Maybe when teams go against oh, the will. Steelers, and yeah, when teams go against the Steelers' um, defense, you're not gonna to want to use that running back or quarterback that's going against them because Devin Bush could come lay the hammer on them. Love it. All right, so uh, what do we got next? So we got the uh, the three wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Fantasy conundrums that are Ezekiel Elliott, Melvin Gordon, and Antonio Brown. So I thought we can just go through uh, kind of each player's little separate scenario, break it down, and then kind of lump them all together there at the end. Mm-hmm. We'll go ahead and start with Zeke. Uh, <laughs> told the Cowboys that he's not going to play in 2019 unless he receives a new contract. Uh, Dallas is looking at kind of their salary cap what they got to work with. Uh, so they're going to, obviously they have like the big three from Dallas that they want to pay. So it's going to be Dak, Zeke, and then Amari Cooper, who's due for a new deal. Uh, so they have $60 currently in cap space right now, uh, projected for 2020 to get all this done. Uh, this is on top if they also want to sign Leo Collins, Byron Jones, and Jalen Smith as well. 
So the Cowboys, they don't have a bunch of wiggle room. Have you know if they want to like retain all of these six guys I mentioned before. Uh, but Jerry Jones, who not surprisingly has been vocal throughout this whole process, came out and said that the uh, Cowboys didn't need a leading rusher to win a Super Bowl. They didn't need a rushing champion, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the three Super Bowls that he won with the Cowboys in the '90s, guess who led the league in rushing every year? Emmitt Smith. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we talked about uh, that yesterday on our show actually when we brought up Zeke. So nuts, man. Nuts. It's just it's. It's definitely crazy. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not for paying most running backs just because I think a lot of them are super replaceable. But a guy like Zeke and how important he is to the Cowboys' offense, I definitely think you got to get a deal done. Uh, what, what, what do you think? What do you, what are your thoughts on this? Um, you know, I don't necessarily like you said. It's funny with with Jerry Jones bringing that up when all of his Super Bowls were with the leading rusher in the NFL. Um, but I'm kind of I'm kind of with him and with you in in the fact that I don't know that I would pay a running back. Um, they are in a tough spot with everybody that they do have to pay on top of that. If it was just you know the, the matter of signing Zeke and just them not necessarily wanting to pay a running back, but they didn't have anybody else to sign, then I would be for you know give Zeke the bag. But in this scenario with everything else that they have to do, I just I don't know. I don't know that I can do it if I'm the Cowboys. Um, and it's not necessarily that I even think like Dak's some superstar or anything like that, or Amari Cooper. I, I do think Amari Cooper is very good. I, I don't know right. what happened in Oakland. Uh, obviously, we saw flashes, but he just he what he led the league in drops two two seasons. So, um, but I, as far as Dak, I, I want to talk about all these guys just because you know getting back to why I don't think that the Cowboys can pay Zeke. I don't think Dak is all that great. At the same time, you're you're good enough to win games. He's get, he gets you to the playoffs, and that's ultimately what it, what the goal. Well, not the goal, but get to the show, try to win it all. You get in the playoffs, you give yourself a chance. I think that Dak does that for the Cowboys, and I don't know. It's not easy to find another guy to do that. You know, franchise quarterbacks yeah. don't grow on trees. If you find a guy, your guy, you got to pay him. And, and what would really make them look stupid though, on the reverse side of that, is taking Zeke fourth overall. And then not paying him beyond his rookie contract. So I mean, it goes both ways. I just it goes back to my my mindset being that I wouldn't pay a running back. And, and I get that Zeke isn't just a running back, um, but I mean, you can pro you can't you can't replace what he does, but you can replicate it very well with a multitude of guys doing what he does. Probably for cheaper, and it's going to take up more roster, obviously, because you're probably talking about two or three guys having to do that. But I don't know. I, I can't. I can't fathom a world where they pay Zeke, Dak, and Amari. I don't know. I, oh, after giving I, Demarcus I like Lawrence I, his I, contract, I'm, I'm higher. I'm higher on Dak than most people. I feel like that. I, I think he's a really good quarterback. Um, I, I just you you can't go into 2019 without Zeke Elliott and think that you're going to win a Super Bowl. And the Cowboys no, right I now, I feel like, are kind of – they're in their own Super Bowl window. Uh, you know, They have really underrated defense. I feel like they have a top five defense in the league, and nobody talks about it. Nobody. They, they get no respect on the defensive side of the ball. Um, I, I don't – for as good as Dak is, I don't think he's strong enough in his own self skills to will the Cowboys to win every single week. You know, I, I think at some point you need to have a guy like Zeke can just carry the load and, you know, pound the ball 25 to 30 times a game, and, you know, get get those tough rushing guards and get them out of situations that they would have to be in. Um, it, is, as far as, like, a fantasy impact, though, um, he's currently drafted at the uh, fourth spot in the leagues right now, so he's still a top five pick. Um, a lot of people are really confident that Dallas will get a deal done before – um, you know, the regular season hits. A lot of people don't expect him to miss any time whatsoever. Uh, do you have any, like, concerns about his situation? Um, t- not ne- nearly as much as Melvin Gordon. I would definitely, I mean, Zeke's a better player than Melvin Gordon as well, so I would be drafting Zeke in front of him regardless. But um, my concern level, I-, I would only say that I wouldn't take him in the top mm, three or four. Beyond that, I'd be fine drafting him in the first round. Because I am right. confident I, I, they'll end up being there. It's like not like without 
like w- without the contract situation, he's like he still wouldn't have been in like the like top like two or three running backs for me, regardless. Uh, so that, I I don't see his draft stock changing at all. Yeah, I mean for me, I I do think that he'll end, he'll end up being there with the Cowboys. Um, and it's not like he's, you know, in the same situation as Melvin Gordon. We're talking about a guy that has this year and then his fifth-year option remaining. You know, how much leverage does he really have there? So I just think at right. the end of the day, he ends up being there. Um, will he sign a new contract with Dallas? I, I don't know, but I think that he does. He is a Cowboy at least this season and next. Well, definitely. Well, transitioning from, you know, a situation that people don't think will absolutely happen to uh, probably the – the most weird situation we've seen since last year with Le'Veon Bell, uh, Melvin Gordon and the shit show that's currently going on with the LA Chargers. Uh, so, uh, like I said, it's obviously a little bit different than Zeke's. Um, the Chargers have a really nice duo with Justin Jackson and Austin Eckler in their backfield to kind of carry the load should Melvin Gordon not be there. So I don't think they're as pressed to uh, get a deal done with Gordon and kind of wiggle should they not want to do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, long, long story short, Melvin Gordon he requested a trade. Uh, the Chargers straight up said, "No, we're not going to trade you. You know, you're you're going to play for us. Or you're basically not going to play at all." Um, so, with you know, on one hand, you look at a guy like Zeke and his situation. Uh, we've seen somewhat positive things about his contract extension talks, um, but you look at Melvin Gordon's, and I, I wanted to pull this up. Uh, the talks between Gordon and the Chargers have been characterized as, quote, rapidly deteriorating. And uh, as somebody who uh, would like to draft him in a fantasy league, that is really concerning. Right. Um, it, it's a completely different situation than Zeke and the fact that the Cowboys, like we said, have all these other pieces they have to pay. They also don't have, you know, who, who's their second running back, Alfred Morris? You know, at least the Chargers are in a yeah, situation where they have that leverage that they have other guys there. Yeah, they have a uh, Tony Pollard and then Alfred Morris. Um, so you know, no disrespect to them, but they're not Zeke. Mm-hmm. You're not going to replace the production that he had last year with them. Um, so uh, unless anything drastic changes, whether it's Melvin Gordon just really wanting to play football in 2019 or the Chargers really wanting Melvin Gordon to be on the roster. I I, I don't think he plays in 2019. I, I think he's dead set in his ways. Uh, his camp reiterated over the weekend that, you know, he wasn't going to play without a new deal. And apparently the Chargers are just not willing to budge. So it's, I personally don't think he's going to play. Mm. So where would you be comfortable taking a flyer on him in a draft? Ah, the golden question. See, that's that's super tough because um, the first two rounds, I absolutely wouldn't touch him at all. Um, around that, like, third, fourth round area is where um, if you really wanted to take a flyer and hope for the best, absolutely. Uh, for me personally, uh, probably, I, I, it, this is really, like, like super deep, but I'm going to say like sixth or seventh round, honestly, with the situation and how everything looks to be playing out. Right. No, I mean, I'm the same way. Like I, I would want to have two other running backs, two other receivers for sure. Right. And, and I mean, then you're hoping, you know, if I'm taking this chance on Melvin Gordon and hopefully he plays, then that's, you know, obviously you got your two other running backs plus him. One of those goes into the flex spot in the ideal scenario. But I mean, right. yeah, so I'm definitely not thinking about him in my first four rounds. Um, fifth round, maybe, but I'm probably still with you in, like, the sixth, seventh being as early. And I'd, I'd, a t- another team is probably, at that point, going to reach for him before and take a flyer. Right. So, you, like, like you said, you definitely want to make sure you get your, um, your, your running back and your two receiver slots filled out. And then, you know, even like the fifth round, if, if there's a strong flex play there, definitely take him over a guy like Gordon. Um, that being said, we could all look stupid. Gordon could end up playing this year, and getting him in the sixth or seventh round would be the steal of the century for fantasy mm-hmm. football players. But, you know, it's just based off the information that we know, uh, you know, you, you can't really trust him with a high pick and expect him in games for your fantasy league next year, taking him like that. Um, right. I would like to point out, though, uh, before we kind of move on to uh, helmets, <laughs> that 
<laughs> Melvin Gordon's agent uh, it was also Jarvis Landry's agent, the one who got Landry out of Miami whenever he had his whole contract dispute. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. Granted, this, the, the situations are a little bit different, um, but just all that his agent can work miracles, That I guess, if you even want to call it that. Um, and also, Gordon and Zeke, they have to show up at some point this year. Uh, it's not a situation like Le'Veon Bell's to where he could sit out the entire year and then be able to walk away as a free agent. Um, they haven't accrued any years on the franchise tag, so they still have to show up. And the tentative date for that is November 29th is when they would have to report. Uh, that would be 31 days before the end of the regular season. So uh, if, if you're a fantasy player, definitely look out for those dates, especially if those guys haven't shown up like the last week of preseason. Uh, but just at some point, they do have to play because if they don't play, they're in the same boat as, as next year. Right. Mhm. Oh man, <laughs> do you uh, do you want to lead us into uh, missed calls from God? Or yeah, I don't know. I'm wearing, I don't know if I can. I don't know <laughs> if I want to do it when I'm wearing this hat. I need a new hat. You no. Um. So anyway, uh, former Steeler, now in Oakland, Antonio Brown. Um right now hasn't really been around the team that much um we know that he had the foot issues he's since deleted his instagram post that kind of showed off those blisters when i say showed off it was one of the most disgusting pictures i've ever seen but he gave us all a glimpse of what he's been dealing with looks painful as hell i would not want to be doing that and, and the thing is if you watch the first episode of hard knocks he actually was still you know like running doing stuff on his feet it was really the cuts and stuff that were giving him trouble um but the People feel like he would be back to practicing, really, if he didn't have a separate issue, which we're going to talk about now, uh, with the helmet. He's trying to wear his old helmet, which is no longer league-approved uh, for safety reasons. We know that the league, you know, obviously has the issues with the CTE, with the former players, the lawsuits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So any chance that they can, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna take these measures now. And there's, you know, what, 32 guys that were affected by this or something like that, including... Antonio Brown, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, and and Antonio Brown even you know pointed that out when he tried to wear his old helmet was that Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers weren't wearing new ones, so someone from the Raiders decided to find video of Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady wearing the new helmets and sent it to Antonio Brown. Mm. Um, <laughs> I would love to be that guy. It's like oh he doesn't believe us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We do get this video. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's apparently a helmet dispute uh, on Friday. He spent two hours pleading his case in front of an arbitrator, um, and we'll see what comes of that. But my, my like, not fantasy related, but I don't see a scenario where the league can't budge on this because that, that's setting a precedent, and then other players are going to come in and want their things done certain ways, and, and the, the league's going to be like, no, and then the players are going to be like, well, why did you do this for Antonio Brown? You know, so the league can't, you know, budge on this for Antonio Brown and then be able to to say no to other guys for certain things. Say, you know, right. if another guy has an issue with helmet. Like, he has a, he's supposed to have, like, a, an official, like, ruling on the whole helmet thing sometime this week. Um, mm-hmm. But I completely agree. You can't – imagine how Ashton in your league would look if you set this hard rule for it. And um, last year was kind of like a um, – like a, like a gap year for players to kind of say, hey, like this is the last year you can wear like said helmet. Like after this year, you won't be able to. And just instituting that rule and then letting a guy like Antonio Brown kind of march into your league office and demand that he uses the same helmet he's been using for the last nine years because it helps him see better. Uh, mm-hmm. You you would lose all credibility right then and there. Uh, but you know, it, as much as I hope the NFL wouldn't do that, do that. Sorry. Um, you, you got to remember what league we're talking about. This is the same league who has some of the worst marijuana problems, uh, in, you know, in terms of uh, punishing players for it. Mm-hmm. Same league that has the worst inconsistency when it comes to player punishments. Um, you know, just if, if you even want to get down to the officials on the field, how the CBAs are set up. I mean, there's a strong possibility that there's going to be a long-term lockout after the end of 2020. So, you know, we'll see about that. But getting back to, like, a fantasy perspective, um, <laughs> Antonio Brown, let me get his ADP up really quick. Antonio Brown's ADP is currently 21 right now. So it's about third, fourth round for most leagues. Um, if if he doesn't play, which he said he wouldn't, I don't know if you remember, there's an interview he did in the offseason with ESPN 
Right. And he said he said he didn't need to play. He's mm-hmm. like, listen, bro, I don't need to play. Like, f- like football, like I don't need it. You know, I, I got all the money in the world. Uh, but you know, saying that if he doesn't play in 2019, he'll end up losing about 30 million dollars in guaranteed money that he would have had. And I would want to point out since you said we're both from Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, I know people have had like questions about whether or not they would still have to pay Antonio Brown. Uh, they would. The $21 million he's owed from Pittsburgh is dead cap money, which essentially means no matter what, he's still going to get paid that $21 million. Uh, but Antonio Brown, fourth round, he's sitting there. How do you feel? Do you, do you, do you take him right now? I mean, most drafts are getting started here in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, yeah. I, I imagine we'll I imagine we'll get like a clear picture of this. Uh, you know, as you know, drafts actually start to begin and unfold. But like right now, where do you feel comfortable with them? Um, in the fourth round, what you're saying, I probably would. Um, I know that he's he's wide receiver seven or eight on most uh, cheat sheets, whether it's you know depending on if it's PPR or non PPR. Um, but I, I don't see a scenario where he's not playing next year. I, I would call his bluff on this um, just because, like you said, the, the money that he'd be walking away from would be insane. Um, yeah. But um, I, I wouldn't take him in the first two rounds. You know, I've, I've seen, like you said, his ADP where it is, um, but I wouldn't take him in the first two rounds if he's, you know, round four, round three or four. It'd be hard for me not to. I would also, once again, getting back to, you know, the Melvin Gordon situation where I kind of want to have some of my roster positions filled already, I probably would already like to have a receiver before I took Antonio Brown because, you know, making him my wide receiver too if he does play is fantastic. I don't know that I feel comfortable with the entire picture right now the way it looks with him being my lead guy. If I already have a receiver and we're talking about him potentially being my number two, I'm fine with that. Definitely, yeah. And, you know, if... If you have your two running backs and you get your wide receiver one and your wide receiver two ends up not playing because of a helmet, that that's kind of the bullet you got to bite at that point. Um, you know, that's, that's the rare off scenario that that actually happens. But, I mean, but ha- having Antonio Brown as a wide receiver two sounds like a really great blueprint idea for a fantasy football player. So I, I, I think fourth round is kind of exactly where he needs to be. I think he even might slide because I, I don't think his ADP has been adjusted since then. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Getting I – just, I just don't see – like, I, I, do you see any scenario where he's not playing though? Man, for a dude who forced his way out of Pittsburgh because he loves money so much, I can't see right. him giving up thirty million. So no. Right. What was the point of all this? <laughs> the the point of all this was to make money. That, that's why he forced his way out. Of no, Pittsburgh. that's what, that's what I'm saying. So what was the point of everything that he did if he's going to end up walking away from the game? Right. You know, I just over a helmet. Like I, you can't. You can keep the same face mask. It, it just needs to be a different style of helmet. Like, mm-hmm. I honestly it's, it's like. I think it's not even about. I, I think it's about proving a point. I don't think it's even about the helmet. Like, I, I think he's just trying to be like the top dog, where it's like I'm getting my way regardless. Maybe I mean, he, he forced his way out of Pittsburgh. He, he took that same exact approach you just mentioned, and that's how he he got himself in a Raiders uniform right now. So you know why 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 would he budge now? You know he the, the players are starting to get so much power in this league compared mm-hmm. to you know how it used to be in the past, where you know in in that scenario where we talked about the league you know looking ridiculous if they budged, um, you know as like crazy as it sounds like they they might actually follow through with that we don't know, um, but yeah dude it, I'm glad AB's out of Pittsburgh. I, that, that man's a wonderful talent on the football field, but boy, he, he is he a headache. Yeah, I kind of I, I feel the same way. Like watching Hard Knocks um, when they did like the the highlight reel for him in Pittsburgh, that kind of like for a second made me stop. And I don't want to say I'm I'm gonna miss the player forever, but to not have to deal with the person anymore is, you know. More than I can ask for. It, it it took for him being somebody else's problem to make me realize how much of a problem he was. Not having to right. defend I, I, I think I think we would be remiss not to acknowledge that he is one of the most talented players to ever put on a Steelers helmet. Right. Um, but just the the person he turned into 
absolutely crazy. But um, kind of Ryan Clark tried to warn us. What's up? I said Ryan Clark tried to warn us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ryan Clark. It, 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 it's funny how everybody's quiet now. Now that he's going off the rails in Oakland, just, just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know the the last few players we talked about Antonio Brown, Melvin Gordon, Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, you know, in, in fantasy, you always kind of want to have a backup plan. Uh, it's always smart for you know some of your star players, you know, just in case. Uh, so handcuffs, you know, not the uh, not the ones the police station Antonio Brown should have been on for going over 100 miles per hour on McKnight Road. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's just fantasy football handcuffs, uh, the insurance policies, quote unquote. So. For for each of these guys, Zeke, Gordon, and A.B., um, who do you see is like their potential handcuffs that if you draft, let's say, Zeke fourth overall like you do, um, who should they target in their drafts to kind of back up their player that they're taking? Mm. Well, in Zeke's scenario, I don't think that that guy's on the Cowboys roster. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're talking about the Cowboys, like we said before, they got Tony Pollard and Alfred Morris behind him. Um, you know, I don't know who, how the touches are going to be split up there, but I really don't have any interest in either of those players. Um, you know, as opposed to the Melvin Gordon situation, where I feel like they do have good handcuffs there. Um, but if, if I'm drafting Zeke, or if I'm drafting Zeke, and I feel like I gotta get somebody else, you're. I don't know where the problem is. I don't know exactly where. This guy's ADP is. Um, but a guy like Marlon Mack or a Damian Williams, I feel like are going to be two very good fantasy players this year. Yeah, um, uh, Marlon Mack has been like... I feel like he's been talked about a lot. Uh, some people even have him as like an RB2 kind of guy, not even necessarily like a handcuff. Mm. And then da Damien Williams is kind of like in the same boat as well. So, I mean, in, in that situation, I think you're looking at the um, the best of both worlds. You know, has you know Zeke doesn't play, uh, you get a cheap replacement for him. And if he does, you have uh, either one really strong uh, you know trade uh, packages to work around and kind of deal out, or you know you just have like a really strong running back core that you can kind of you know value from week to week. So. Um, that'll definitely be good, but I, I'm actually going to stay on the Cowboys roster for Zeke because Tony Pollard is indeed that guy for Dallas. Uh, Jerry Jones came out and said that he would be able to handle the workload should he want to be, um, or sorry, should Zeke not even show up. Uh, shout out to Logan Bell because I was actually talking to him about this last night. Uh, he said that he believes that Pollard would take probably a 45-30 to 25 split in terms of carries, and he would see majority of, you know, all that production that Zeke would be leaving behind. Uh, so Pollard, he's essentially free. His ADP is 186 right now. Um, that's undrafted at this point. So last round, instead of taking that second kicker, grab Tony Pollard. You know, worst case scenario, Zeke plays, you could just drop him. Now, do you think that he has standalone value? Sorry, one more time. Do you think that Pollard has standalone value? So... Essentially, if Zeke is there, do you think that Pollard is drafted? Got you. Not at all. No, if, if Zeke's in the picture, I, I think he has such like this workhorse load ahead of him that he's had for the last couple of years. That if, if Zeke should play, and like me and you discussed, you know, if you know he's going to play and he has to play, he is. Um, th there's no point in drafting Pollard. But I mean, so, some leagues have. Like and uh, in a lot of cases that backup insurance policy. So you know if if you are going to take a like a super late round of fire on a guy or even like waivers like the week after your draft. Uh, for me, Tony Pollard's the guy. Mm, okay. Um. Real quick, getting back to something that uh just got put in the comments here. Um. Going back to the Antonio Brown situation. Actually, people are still saying we got fleeced despite the fact that getting another third allowed us to get Devin Bush, and now all this nonsense is happening. The Steelers did say that. They said getting that extra third was the reason that they were able to trade for Devin Bush because they wouldn't have wanted to do it, you know, not having a second and then also not having a third following Right. So, You're right. Yeah. Um, but, okay. Um, yeah, I, I as far as Tony Pollard goes, it's an interesting name. Um, what 
What year is he in? Uh, I believe he... I don't remember him being on the roster last year. Uh, oh. I think... I don't think he's a rookie either. Let me double-check that for you really quick. Tony Pollard. He's a rookie. He was shafted in the fourth round this year. Oh, okay. Hmm. Interesting. All right, so I maybe mean, hey, a name if, to watch if, out if there a, for. If, if you're in a dynasty league and you have Zeke... Um, I'm sure you guys have already had your rookie drafts already, but I mean, Tony Pollard might be a guy you want to pick up on waivers. If yeah, sure. and that's that's an that's a situation that I'm sure people are going to be monitoring. With obviously Zeke being a top five pick if he's there, you know. So if people, if you haven't had your draft yet, keep monitoring the situation. If you're going to take Zeke, maybe you take Tony Pollard later to handcuff with him. Yeah. All right, Melvin Gordon. <laughs> Uh, do you want to go first or do you want me to take this? Because I think I have the rare opinion on this matter. Okay, so Melvin Gordon, um, I actually really like the other running backs on that roster. Um, I like both of them. I think that they both have value should Melvin Gordon not be there. Um, I think that Austin Eckler's role is carved out already, regardless of what it is. So I don't know that that's going to change too much. But I think Jack, it's Jackson that sees the bigger uptick there if Gordon should not be there. So I would think, I would say that just... Justin Jackson's the back to own, but the, I mean, I would want both. I mean, I would take both of them. I would take either one. I'm, I don't know if I'd have both of them on the same roster. I would have either one, but I prefer to have Justin Jackson on my roster. Well, there goes my take. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, it, well if, if you look around, like, the fantasy community, like, a lot of people are taking Austin Eckler. Eckler's ADP right now is sitting at 80. Um, so, you know, it, it's like top 10 rounds worth of picks. So people obviously think highly of him. And as they should, he's, he's a really good football player. He did a lot, you know, even with Melvin Gordon starting last year. But, like, Justin Jackson is definitely going to be the guy that you might want to take just in terms of value. Uh, Jackson's ADP is going to be almost 100 spots uh, further from Eckler's. And obviously, you don't draft 100 players in fantasy. Uh, so he's basically going undrafted in, like, a lot of the leagues. But... I mean, like you just talked about, Austin Eckler, he's mostly, he's prominently a pass-catching running back. And, you know, a lot of people in L.A. expect that Justin Jackson will be the guy to step up should Melvin Gordon not play. Um, I know against the Steelers, uh, you know, whenever Melvin Gordon was being, like, spelled out, it was Justin Jackson carrying the load for the Chargers. And, you know, mm -hmm. he, he's the guy who's proven that, you know, he can run between the tackles. He can take 15, 20 carries a game if absolutely needed. So mm -hmm. I think just in terms of value, Justin Jackson is definitely the way to go. So you weren't expecting uh, us to agree on that? You thought I was going to be on the Austin Eckler train as well? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't absolutely know that you were going to do that. But, hey, it's fantasy, baby. Yeah. So where do you feel – we already kind of talked about where you feel comfortable drafting – Melvin Gordon. The other two, though, where would you want to draft Jackson and Eckler? Uh, you know, Jackson, I, if, if I can get Jackson in, like, the 14th, like, 15th round, right right about where, like, most people start drafting their, like, defenses and kickers, um, I would feel comfortable taking him there. I, I feel like the average fantasy player isn't going to look at a draft board and spot Justin Jackson out and just snag him in, like, the 11th or 12th round. Um, Austin Eckler, I, I, I would feel comfortable taking him. It's, it's tough, man, especially like given what I just said about Justin Jackson. I would say probably the, I don't know, I, I got to go double-digit rounds and kind of stick to my guns here. I, I don't think Eckler's production, whether Gordon plays in 2019 or not, is going to essentially rise uh, from last year. So, I mean, granted, he's a great football player, but... If if I if I believe that Jackson's going to be the lead back and that's kind of what I'm seeing and hearing from people that cover the Chargers, that I don't I can't value Eckler any like more than like a tenth round pick. Yeah, and and that even you know if it's not a PPR league, that's even less. Oh wow, yeah. If 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 we're not talking PPR here, the standard leagues drop them all the way down, probably like the thirteenth or fourteenth round. Mhm. Mm yeah. Agreed. Good point, man. Good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not everybody does PPR, obviously, so figured out. Yeah, I'd, if you're I'd not in the PPR that, league, get in the PPR league. What are you doing? <laughs> Change it. Change your league. 
If it's not your lead, just be like Antonio Brown and force your way into what you want. Yeah, just force your way out, yeah. Yeah, how, how do you uh, feel about kickers and defenses in leagues? Oh, boy. Um, I would be completely fine if I didn't have to take either. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I've seen leagues, though, where both of those positions win the lead for teams. Um, I am typically on the train of I stream a different one each week. I never draft them high, and then I'll, you know, as I only draft one of each, obviously, and then as the season goes along, when the bye week comes up or maybe matchup-based, I'll just pick a new defense up or a new kicker up every single week. Um, kickers, uh, I guess more so than defense, are typically like so close in scoring, where defense you can have... You know, the Bears defense, which is going to score a touchdown every single week, it seems like. So, but, um, yeah, I'm on, I'm definitely on the train of streaming a new one each week, to be honest. Yeah, I'm definitely big on streaming defenses. I'll, I'll draft the defense I like for week one, and then I'll just kind of stream from yeah. there. But you I don't what? see any value in taking defenses, like, 12th or 13th round. That's, like, actually a big thing now with, with, like, the week one matchup because they actually, on cheat sheets now, show the defense, who the defense plays week one, which that really? wasn't the case before. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Shit, man. Catching on. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Catching on. All right, so handcuff for Antonio Brown. So if you draft AB um, at his 21 uh, average draft position right now, um, who, who are you kind of targeting to replace him should he not play? Well... To be honest, I really liked Tyrell Williams to begin with going into free agency. Now, if Antonio Brown is there, I think that opens the door for him to actually be better than if he wasn't there. I, I, I think he'll get more targets without him, but obviously the defense is going to be more focused on him if Antonio Brown's not there. Yeah. So you kind of have to look up and down the Raiders roster and see if there's somebody else to kind of open the door for Tyrell Williams to, to be a number one, maybe take some pressure off of him. And there are other receivers on the roster. Um, Marce, as of right now, obviously we're in preseason. Marcel Aitman, um, Keelan Doss, Rico Gafford, Ryan Grant, who they signed, who was actually, um, what was, was that just last year or the year before in free agency that he actually like got a decent contract, but then he failed a physical. And then he ended up going to, was that with, well, that, was, that was with Baltimore originally. He failed the physical with Baltimore. He ended up playing yeah, with Baltimore the Colts. Yeah, um, Dwayne Harris, Keon Hatcher, Jordan Lasley, J.J. Nelson, former Cardinal. Uh, what is this name? DeMornay Pearson L. Hunter Renfro, Clemson. And, well, Tyra Williams, of course. So, right. so yeah, that's not a, not a great receiving group. Sans Antonio Brown. Right. You know, it, uh, opportunity mostly is king fantasy football can't talk to that uh but on a team like the raiders where you know tyra williams is potentially your number one receiver and he's looking at probably a fair amount of double teams just because you if you're a secondary you want to eliminate tyra williams and i mean hey if, if hunter renfro beats you then you kind of got to tip your cap to them at the end of the day um so you definitely got to look at other receiving options outside of the raiders um, I, I feel like if, if you're picking a receiver on the Raiders to do anything, I feel like it'd be Hunter Renfro, just because he'll be working out of the slot mostly, and you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you can't double team people in the slot, and he looked actually really good in the Raiders preseason game. I don't know if you saw him or not, uh, but he, he looked nice coming out of the uh, breaks and the routes he was running. So, um, do you have anybody like outside of the Raiders that you want to take for him? Oh man, tough question, tough question. Um, like I said, if I'm drafting Antonio Brown, he's not my wide receiver one anyway. So I already have a wide receiver one on my roster in this scenario. Um, man. So we're probably talking, when would I take another receiver? See, I would, I would kind of look to a guy like D.D. Westbrook in Jacksonville. Um, coming off of an injury, uh, you know, he's not in a very crowded receiving core. Uh, Jacksonville just signed Nick Foles in the offseason, so mm-hmm. and, and definitely a guy of interest for me that I've been kind of keeping an eye on through this whole offseason. And, and Marquise Lee is out probably a couple weeks as well. Yep, so, yep. he uh, yeah. just got hurt. He might, he might miss the opener as well. So, I think a name that we brought up already could be interesting too in Christian Kirk. Christian Kirk, um, yeah. Do you do you know where he's being valued at right now? Because I don't I don't have a ton of 
Christian Kirk uh, fantasy ADP on me. Fantasy football ADP number 82. Uh, I feel super comfortable taking him in around the 10th or 11th round. Um, especially yeah. with like the upside he brings in uh, Cliff Kingsbury offense with a deteriorating but still phenomenal Larry Fitzgerald and the up-tempo offense and you got a gunslinger with Kyle yeah I mean 10th or 11th round at that point you've already obviously filled out your starting positions and even your flex probably at that point so yeah. you're talking about drafting Christian Kirk as like a bench option which you just hope can kind of take over that role as a flex or wide receiver too yeah you know if if you're if you're sitting at a point where you got Christian Kirk in a flex I think you got to feel pretty good about your fantasy football team yeah and, and, and what if he's on your bench <laughs> if he's on your bench <laughs> yeah he's on your bench hit me up man I want to see how you play fantasy yeah. So, uh, this, um, uh, uh, go ahead. I was just say, uh, reading one of the comments here, this is a very interesting thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, one of, a uh, friend of the show, uh, Tyler, he's in a league that uh, the site that they play on, the commissioner actually built himself. So, it's a semi standard scoring. There are no trades. They can pick up one free agent after week one without dropping anyone, and then one every two weeks after that if we choose to drop someone. Really? Yeah. Sorry, uh, Tyler, I don't know that we're going to have much advice for you on this show for that lead, because <laughs> that's something that we've never heard of. Uh, yeah, Herb even said that's an interesting lead. Uh, he said it really is. There's some different strategy involved, but injuries and bye weeks can get interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Definitely, yeah. I'm in a league, I'm in a league that has you can only make um, two moves per week, and I feel like sometimes that's, you know, you never know with injuries and stuff. Like I could have three guys get hurt, and then what do I do? Yeah, uh, Tyler, get get a hold of us, and then we can actually like look at more into like the rules of the league. We definitely try to help you out, though. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Also, there's no flex position, but we have three receivers that can also include tight ends. Which I mean, I feel like a lot of t leagues do do the wide receiver, running back, tight end flex. Um, yep. You know, I don't typically see too many people that have two tight ends worth playing like that as a flex position as opposed to running back yeah, or no, wide receiver. No, not but. unless you have like two strong like tight ends. Like probably yeah. like like George Kittle or like Zach Ertz if you go tight end heavy in the first like mm -hmm. three rounds. Right. That's great. Man. PPR monsters. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Tyler, hit us up with more info on the league. We'll definitely try to help you out with there. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, going to this for myself. If, yeah, if, if anybody has any just like questions about their league in general, uh, go ahead, feel free to uh, DM us at around the four one two. It just even like Smitty's personal account. What's your at name, Smitty? Uh, at Z twenty three Smitty. At Z also, Smitty. Also, oh, I forgot you can't see me. I just dabbed. What's up? <laughs> I forgot that you can't see me. Only they can because I just dabbed. <clears throat> yeah, let's say I, I I I have like no <laughs> chat. Like whatsoever, which kind of sucks. But uh, hit me up on Twitter at Donnie Druin. Uh, just hit any of us up. We'll be more than happy to help you. Um, so last segment of the show, this is actually Smitty's idea. Um, I loved this idea. Uh, do you, uh, you want to take this from here? Okay. So um, I figured it'd be a good idea. We're going to do a segment called Take the Leap, um, which the idea with this is – we're talking, you know, guys that finished probably in the number two range. Actually, maybe, you know, maybe there's even more of a leap. Maybe guys finished at number three at their position or something like that. Like a wide receiver three or wide receiver two, running back two or three, quarterback two, that are ready to make that leap to being the number one, like a number one, a guy that you can start at those positions, QB one, RB one, wide receiver one. Um, so looking at those things, um, I actually was hoping that you would start this. Even though I was introducing okay. the segment, yeah, I'll, I will, <laughs> I will kick it off. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just to kind of like give a basis for like background on this. Uh, I went and looked last year at the uh, finishers. Uh, so whenever I reference like QB two, this is solely based off of twenty eighteen performance. Uh, and then you know, just obviously, I think they're going to finish as like a position one where they're at uh, quarterback. So my QB one 
that it was a QB2 last year. Taking the leap is going to be none other than the Baker Mayfield. I know he's a popular pick uh, if, you know, you and your friends are going to talk about this segment. He's got a brand new shiny toy in Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, we saw the flashes of what Baker can do in an offense. Uh, Todd Haley is gone. Hugh Jackson is gone. There seems to be some competent people in Cleveland's coaching staff now. So, you know, thank God for Baker. Uh, you know, he's still got Jarvis Landry. Uh, he's got Nick Chubb for eight weeks. And he's got one of the best running backs in the game in Kareem Hunt coming back after week eight. Uh, you know, so he's got all of the pieces to succeed. He's had a uh, you know season of play underneath his belt. He's had a full off season of being the starting quarterback for the Browns under his belt now, and yeah, the people expect big things from him. He's supposed to take off, and I think he will. Okay, so I gotta pick somebody else. <laughs> um, but I do I do have two other names in mind as far as QB, and this is actually more of a leap than just going from QB two to QB one. Jameis Here. Winston. Really? Are you a Jameis truther? I I feel I I'm not necessarily I'm more of a Bruce Arians truther. I believe in what oh. Bruce Arians is going to do for him in that offense. Um I, I feel like Bruce Arians with that offense, I think that he does have a good amount of weapons. I'm a big Chris Godwin fan. Um and I expect him to take a huge leap this year as well. Uh, Mike Evans obviously is Mike Evans. Um I think OJ Howard is a beast. Um, I, I'm curious to see what they get from the running game, and I think that you can even see like an uptick for, for Peyton Barber, Ronald Jones, whichever one ends up winning that running back competition or however the splits go. But, yeah, I think that Jameis Winston is going to be a QB1 this year. Damn, that's uh, that's bold to me. I, I can't even bullshit you. It's kind you of know bold. what, should that, have, should that have been an overreaction? I, no. <laughs> I, I, had, had you put that in, I think people would have – kind of bought the overreaction part but no like Winston he he'll always have the volume there and it helps that Bruce Arians is going to be there now uh just like the the turnovers and just the overall decision making for me kind of turns me away from Winston um you know but like you pointed out Bruce Arians is there now you know he's worked wonders with quarterbacks before and you know the, he'll probably yeah wrong. we'll see Right, so uh, my RB2 from, uh, you know, 2018, uh, going to stay in Cleveland. I'm going to go with Nick Chubb. I think the eight weeks of just him is going to help him tremendously. I think that he's going to be a valuable asset in both the running and the passing game as well. I think, uh, you know, there's not a lot of tread on his tires. So I, I think, you know, the Browns might be comfortable, uh, you know, giving the ball to him a lot, help him take some pressure off of Baker Mayfield. Uh, you know, especially in a PPR league, I, I think he's going to work wonders. That's a, that's a good pick. Uh, there, there was three that came to mind, um, and one of these is in a – well, actually, two of these are in new offenses. Um, Kenyon Drake and Aaron Jones, both in new offenses. And Kenyon Drake's a guy that I love the talent. I, I was kind of upset with the way that Miami used him last year, still trying to, to find whatever's left in Frank Gore and – Whatever's left in that gas tank, all that tread on the tires, they were still using him over um, Kenyon Drake. So, But I'm a big fan of Kenyon Drake. Hopefully they utilize him in Miami now, um, especially as a pass catcher as well. Um, so with him, uh, Aaron Jones averaged over six yards of carry last year, and it just seemed like Green Bay would not commit to him for 15 to 20 touches a game. Um, but I think that with the new offense with Matt LaFleur being there now as the head coach, um, I think that they will commit a little bit more to the run, take some pressure off Aaron Rodgers. And I think he's another guy that can, can catch the ball to the backfield if asked to do so. So I, I'm a big fan of Aaron Jones. Um, and then there was one more name that I had in mind. Nobody ran the ball more than Seattle last year. Chris Carson finished as an RB2 last year. I think I think he could make the jump to number one. Why, why I said the other two names first is because they also have Rashad Penny there. So I think that right. it's going to be more of like a split. And I don't know if Chris Carson's going to put up RB1 numbers because of that. But I think if you look at like based off the amount of touches he gets, if you were to uh, figure out what that would equal over, you know, so many touches, if he actually were getting the right amount of touches, like 20 touches a game, the production would be there for an RB1. But I don't know if he hits those numbers because of the split he's going to have with Rashad Penny. Right, yeah. But I do like Chris um, Carson. I, I, I was looking at Aaron Jones as my potential uh, take-the-leap guy at the running back position, so I'm, I'm glad you did take him because I was seriously considering a wank him. 
so my wide receiver is it, it might be surprising a little bit just because he's a big name but just due to injuries he hasn't produced that wide receiver one numbers the last couple of years it's going to be Keenan Allen um, you know, I mm. hold Keenan Allen in, in very high regards, uh, but in 2018, he finished as a wide receiver, too. Um, I think the Melvin Gordon holdout would help his numbers go up. Not tremendously, but I think it would help boost him a little bit. Um, I think should he stay healthy, he's one of the best receivers in the game. I think the volume from Phillip Rivers uh, would be astronomical should he play all 16 games. Um, like I already spoke to his skill set, he's one of the best route runners in the league. He's got some of the best hands in the league, and he's a problem. He's a legit problem for defenses to try to cover. So, you know, I'm just really banking on him staying healthy. Yeah. This my, my first guy is kind of right on the bubble. Uh, he he pretty much finishes an RB, or not RB, wide receiver one last year, so I can't go with him. I love Robert Woods, but I can't take Robert. him because he actually finished his wide receiver 10 last year. Anyway, so my actual pick because of that, Amari Cooper. What he did in Dallas after he got traded there was ridiculous. I think that he's a wide receiver one this year in a full season. Yeah, I, I think the 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 latter half of um, whenever he played with Dallas, I, I think he showed a lot of promise. I think now that Dak and him can kind of get that chemistry down a little bit better and he'll uh, kind of know what system he's playing in and get away from the, the fiery trash can of hell that was the Oakland Raiders last year. Uh, but I, I think that'll all kind of benefit him, and hopefully he's um, you know kind of fine-tuned his skill set per se. Um, did you do a tight end? Because we didn't talk about tight ends. I did. Um, but I just want to make sure. you know what you go ahead. I could probably find one here. I'll look. I'll, oh yeah, okay. I got mine already. No, so go ahead. You just ran wagon off mine. Uh, I am pounding the table for Evan Ingram this year to take the leap. Mm. Uh, that Giants offense, whether it be suspensions or just injuries, uh, the the gates that have been have opened up for Evan Ingram to take the leap as a tight end one this year. Um, I think he's going to finish the top five tight end personally just because the volume that's going to be there for him is going to be astronomical. Yeah. Um, if he didn't have the short suspension that he does, does, I'd probably go with Chris Herndon with the Jets. I'm going to take Mark Andrews with the Ravens. Mark Andrews, yeah, super popular pick. Um, the, the only... The only question about that is the Ravens also drafted Hayden Hurst last year. And yeah. mm-hmm. it, at least to my understanding, Hurst was more of a receiving tight end going into 2018 as opposed to Andrews. Mm. Right, right. Um, yeah, just looking at – so I'm looking at the, the tight end list right now where guys finished, and it is very um, – what's the word I'm looking for here? Watered down, if you will, when you get towards the back yeah. end. It's, I mean, it's, it's tough because, like, tight end, at least, like, this year in football, you have, like, the top three tight ends, Kelsey, Kittle, and Ertz. And then after that, it, it's honestly just a crapshoot in your drafts of, you know, where you're going to pick tight ends because, you know, I, I'm a big fan of grabbing a guy like Delaney Walker or Jordan Reed, like, later in the draft as opposed to spending a high pick on a well, tight end. Yeah, that's the thing. is like Jordan Reed would be up at the top if he could stay on the field. Exactly. But, you know, I guess – you can't predict injuries, so I'll kind of always be willing to take that risk. Um, but, yeah, he's a guy that hasn't played 16 games. Because even looking at this, like, Jesse James finished as tight end 21 last year. Really? Like, yeah. Um, and that's just under Dallas Goddard, who is an interesting name. Because, obviously, they have Zach Ertz there already, too. But I think that they could find a way to get both tight ends involved, similar to how New England did when they had their two tight ends. Who I don't want to mention the names of. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Um, let us know how you feel about that segment that was kind of thrown in there at the last second. But uh, I thought it'd be interesting to do. Um, see if they see if these guys can can make the leap. We'll uh, we'll trot these down and uh, and make sure to update you guys on how these things are going. <laughs> um, Tyler did just come in here beefy and say question. Not for pro football. Should I do college fantasy? I've always thought that college fantasy was just because you couldn't make money off of the athletes. But apparently it's a thing. Um, so I, I would love to get into a college league. I'm sure it works kind of like pro leagues. But uh, if, if you can do it, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it, it's just so tough to know how many schools there are. Like, it, are non-FBS schools included as well? And, like, I mean... It's just crazy because those guys play against the competition that they do to actually be much higher scoring than guys at FBS schools. 
Definitely. Yeah. You're looking at like, like 300 points like regularly on the weeks, yeah. Right. But that's something we got to talk about more. Um, anyway, um, that's pretty much it that wraps it up. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us. Uh, Donnie, once again, throw out your socials if you want so people know where to reach out. Uh, so hit us up on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me personally, at Donnie Juren. Uh, follow Smitty. Uh, remind me if I butchered this. Z23 Smitty, yeah? You got it, yep. Not a, not a burner. Not a burner. Hashtag not a burner. <laughs> uh, you know, follow the Around the 412 podcast account. It should be uh, at Around the 412, just straight up like that, yeah? Mm-hmm, yep. And as you can see, uh, right by where the chat should be, this direction, um, there is the PodHub Network logo. Around the 412 collectively is part of the PodHub Network. So go on over to podhubnetwork.com. Take a look at all the shows that are part of the platform, uh, doing some really cool things over there, so check them out. Um, like Donnie said, follow us on Twitter. Let us know what you want to see more of, what you want to see less of, what you'd like to see next time. Uh, we'll update you and we're going to be doing another show. Um, this will be put out on platforms to listen to as a podcast as well if you weren't able to join us live. So um, if you're listening to this way after, thanks for listening. Um, and come follow us on Twitch. You can join us live next time and interact with us similar to these guys we're able to do today. Um, until then, signing off for this time are Smitty and Donnie. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Deuce.